what up, Long Beach? Welcome back to your home for everything local sports, where we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Another episode of Long Beach Sports Talk. We'll explain that in just a second. As always, I am co-sports editor J.J. Fiddler. To my right, co-sports editor Mike Gardabasio. This year means something to me, J.J. And to my right... Tyler, at least a 2.0 GPA Hendrickson, and uh, gotta thank our sponsors, who um, I mean, they are fully cleared and ready to go, food-wise, <laughs> down on 2nd Street, Naples Rib Company, and Papalucci's. Thank you so much for making this show possible, and making such delicious grub. Yeah, they do put the eat in 2nd Street, and they're both getting ace. Perfect, perfect, perfect guarantee. 2.0 GPA. <laughs> we do have some great games this week. We got a matchup at La Mirada we're gonna talk about. We're gonna kind of review how Bosco got to where they are right now, but before all of that, we're going to do something we'd rather not do. Talk about forfeits and ineligibilities and uh. problems that continue to crop up in more league football. We broke the story yesterday that Jordan is the latest more league football team to forfeit a victory. It was their victory over Wilson. A great game that I was at that now theoretically doesn't matter. It's a 2 nothing victory for Wilson. Fourth time in two years that a more league football team has forfeited a game because of an ineligible player. Second time in two weeks, because Wilson did that to the victory against St. Anthony two weeks ago. And this is the seventh time in three years that a more league football team has had a forfeited victory. In the immortal words of Kevin from Home Alone, JJ, woof. I mean, what can we possibly do about this situation? You and I have been covering more league football since 2008, and we've never had a year without having to write this story. You made the joke to me, uh, these stories keep getting shorter and shorter, because I keep writing the same thing over and it's over true, again. It's true, man. What el- how else can you say, quote, we know we won the game, end quote? Yeah, I mean, and, and you mentioned, Jay, I mean, there's been four in the last two years, but it's really only a year and a half. I mean, we're at the midway point of this season, so there's and not well, there's to be, time. You not got to, the time. Yeah, not to be negative about it, but there's still plenty of games ahead, and I think that's a good point. We have this problem. It's been an ongoing problem that has not gotten better. It's not trending towards getting better. So what in the world can we do to make sure this doesn't keep happening? Because it's terrible for the kids. They go out and win a game, and then, no, 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 you didn't actually win because of an ineligibility. And it's like, come on. Yeah, that is the problem. The problem being that a lot of people who are responsible for things like this, keeping kids eligible, or more importantly, making sure that paperwork is filed correctly, those people will never be have never been, and aren't on our sports website. And that's frustrating, because we report sports. And we'd much rather be talking about the more league games that are happening this week, as opposed to the more league games that didn't happen last week, theoretically. What what you're saying, just to be clear for people who don't understand the chain, is basically that the administration, the front office people, the people in the 100 building at these schools, aren't that they're not sports people, is what you're saying. That Yeah, they're not sports people, but that's not their fault. But it is their fault that some of these things have gone wrong, therefore affecting the sports of their school, the sports of their city, and like we said, more importantly, the kids. You know, the kids know they played that game. The kids know what happened in that game. But unfortunately, down the road, that's not what people are going to remember about that game. Well, I, you, you brought up the kids. I mean, I think if, if we were sort of – Tyler said before he didn't want to be negative, and I, I'll flat out say I, I am pretty negative about this. I, I'm sick and tired of – well, you're the one who's been writing them, but I'm sick and tired of getting that text from you at 11 a.m. on what looks like a sunny, clear day saying, oh, by the way, another team is forfeit. I think that there's blame to go around for everybody on this. You mentioned the administrators, which in both of these schools, Jordan and Wilson this year, have said this is a clerical error, uh, an error by our administration, not by our coaching staff. But to me, the administration has to take blame. The coaches have to take some blame because it's still their kid in their roster. That's they've, a good got, point. they've got to see the process through. But the kids also have to take some blame. That's a good point. You and need their, to know. And their parents have to take. You some need blame. to know whether or not you're eligible. Bottom line. Okay, let's start there. You Absolutely. need to know what your grade point average is and because you're not and it shouldn't be ineligible. Well, you're not. And if the, if, <laughs> co- if high school coaches aren't teaching this, they should be. You're not responsible only for yourself by being on a team of any kind. You're also responsible for the people around you, the people you call your teammates. In some cases, the people you end up calling your family and your brothers. You're responsible for them. If you don't know if you've got your stuff handled, then you can't be able to handle somebody else's or even your team's business when it's time to strap it on and play the game. Well, it all starts with every kid in high school should be getting a 2.0 GPA at least. Let's just start with that. Amen. Obviously, that's not going to happen. 
uh, you know, I'm not naive, but let's start with that. But I'll even, but I'll even back that up, Tyler. I mean, it's get as many B's as you get D's. Go to summer school, right? Go and to summer school. Pass your summer school class because that's been a problem. Your kids take summer school and they're not passing the summer school class. It's not middle school anymore. You need to be, you know, start growing up as you go on and become an adult. Here's what it boils down to, though: is you've got to get the grades right. I mean, if you, if you, uh, we see kids on Twitter. You got to get time. the grades right, or you got to get the grades. Right? right? Question mark. I mean, uh, we see kids on, on Twitter all the time saying, oh, you know, D1 bound, I've got D1 dreams, whatever. You're not getting into college without a 2.5 GPA with the new NCAA standards. Number one. Amen. Okay, if you're not going to college, you, want, you still want to play high school football, you're not getting on the field without a 2.0 GPA. And even if you don't want to do either of those things, you're just hanging out, and you're eventually going to want to go get a job, You're any job you want to have, you're going to have to have a high school diploma. And if you flunk out of high school, you're not going to get a high school diploma. So get the grades. Use the resources that are there. I mean, we know all these coaches. Well, so there, there's, there's resources for these kids within the teams to try and reach out and get extra help. You know, I, I mean, I, it, I find it hard to believe that a John Kane or a John Jansen and Jordan and Wilson wouldn't give these kids, if the kids were coming to them, if the kids are asking for help, that they wouldn't be able to do that. So, again, to me, obviously you point the finger at the adults a lot, and I, have, I don't have a problem with that because it is ultimately their responsibility. But it starts with there wouldn't be a responsibility if the kids all had a 2.5. And you can't ask the coaches to do that much more. How much are we really going to ask a walk-on high school football coach who's getting paid a minimal stipend to do paperwork while also trying to run a high school football program? Well, and mistakes are going to be made occasionally, you know, that these happen. And there's other ways to have ineligibilities, whether it's transfer stuff and things like that. And these rules can be complicated. There's no silver bullet. There's no one hire that every school is going to be able to make or can make that's just magically going to fix this problem. So I think the short answer really is everyone has to do a little bit better and take a little bit more care to make sure that this doesn't happen within your program. Yeah, it's asking a lot of the coaches, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's their program, and the administrators have to show the extra level of intent. And like you said, Mike, the kids have the responsibility first and foremost to do what they need to do and make sure that they have that uh, GPA they need. I, I, it, it boils down to everyone has to do better. Like what you just said, there's, there's a chain and a process for this that needs to get better. But this is a league where we've had Milliken and Compton uh, play in a CIF championship game. This is a league where half the teams in the league have won championships. It's a big talent, it used to be a big respect league. And that stuff's fading away, and it's fading away in part because of this. And, and that's what bothers me. I talked to Keith Hansen last night after a Century Club meeting. Keith was an uh, administrator at Wilson and at Lakewood. And Keith said, you know, it, he was watching the football game, the Wilson-Jordan game that you were at, Jage, with Chris Steinhauser, the superintendent. And Keith said he told the superintendent, you know, what bothers me is people act like this stuff isn't a big deal. Because it happens so much now. And every school besides Poly, we've had six of the seven schools have forfeited a game due to an eligibility since JJ and I have been covering sports, which is only seven years. Okay? Six of the seven schools have had a forfeiture. And Keith's point was, this is the basic first thing. It's as bad as sending a kid out there without a uniform. Because they don't have the basic clearance to be playing football. And so there's this, you know, you mentioned, Jason, we know, the, we know we won the game. I'm not putting that on the field crap in my articles anymore. Because you didn't win the game. You cheated, whether you meant to or not, whether you knew you were or not. You played a kid who is not allowed to play football. That's not a win on the field. That's nothing. That's a loss. And it's a loss for the league and for the entire city. No doubt. No doubt. And we are not the only ones who are getting fed up with this. I talked to multiple more league coaches who would rather stay off the record who were complaining about problems that they've had with their administration or things that have, they were promised that they didn't get. And basically what I'm trying to get at is a lot of these coaches are hamstrung by stuff that we don't see. There's common misconceptions when you hear about an ineligibility where you hear about a lot of that stuff in college institutional control immediately the fingers pointed at the head coach that's not the case here and we had one coach who left a comment on facebook that basically said exactly that he said quote this stuff only hurts the kids and the coaches that put the blood sweat the tears into spring and summer and fall workouts when the coaches turn in the paperwork on each player to the administration they return it at either as either eligible not eligible or probationary status. This is supposed to be done before the first game of the season. Now he goes on to explain that one of the problems here is those people in the administration building that do end up clearing this paperwork, finally, they don't start work until these football teams are already pretty much ready to go for their first game. And in some cases, 
are already or have already played their first game. Well, the p- kids and teachers, I mean, the school is not really going the first day of classes with the way that the schedule got pushed back a week is often now not until after the second football game, but it's never before the first football game. There it's are, not week a, zero. So. There's always a game being played before the school is going, and that was a decision made. Again, we talk about everyone needing to do better. That was a decision made essentially by the CIF state so that they could sell an extra week of televised games with the regional bowl games. Was that a decision made in order to, to help student athletes? Athletes? No. That was a decision made so they could sell a TV contract to Time Warner, which, again, I question how you, you look at inner city athletes in Long Beach. How does this benefit them? It doesn't. It flat out does not. Bottom line, we're not happy about it. No one's happy about it. And we hope that it gets better. And it starts with everyone doing a little bit to pull their weight and do a better job of making sure this doesn't happen again. Did we miss something? Let us know your thoughts. Comment on this story. Let's send us an email. Hit us up on Twitter or Facebook, all that stuff. This is your community. These are your sports teams. How much longer is it going to take for something like this to get fixed? Neither wind, nor rain, nor sleet, nor lightning delay can keep our own Chris Trevino from coming back from Vegas safely and getting back on LBST. What up, Chris? Welcome home. A tough game to go to, I'm sure, for you and the Bosco faithful because St. John Bosco went out there and took the best from Bishop Gorman and almost took it right back in the second half in a loss. Yeah, they didn't They didn't play their best 24-point uh, deficit there late in the, the second half, but to make that up against the number two team, almost doing that on the road, losing by three, uh, Impressive, but still they didn't play their best, and they could have they could have walked away with the win there. That's how they felt after that game. I think they were definitely uh, pleased that they were in there in the second half. You know, they made some plays. An onside kick goes a little bit differently, and you know we might be talking about how Bosco came away with an in- in- amazing comeback. But they definitely realized that they did not play their best in the first half. They were down 17 points going to the break, and only got worse a little bit after that. So. They're not super happy about what how they played over there, but they're still uh, confident in their abilities. You and I talked about the Bosco defense, how they are young and inexperienced. They're picking up experience week in, week out. How did you feel about them? I knew this was going to be their first real test of the season. I mean, you could argue that Central Catholic was that first real test, but just so many weapons for Gorman with Tate Martell and Alizé Jones and Cordell Brodus and Russell Booz and just the list goes on and on. And they definitely got worked in some areas you know Russell had over 150 yards rushing had that big 80 yard gash uh, in the first half but that second half they really turned up their intensity and they shut them out for the rest of the game I thought that was really impressive they made plays late to get their team back into this was it adjustments or was it playmakers you know I think it was just playmakers Uh, Negro said they didn't make a lot of adjustments going into the half they just needed to play better simply put and I think once the offense gave that them a touchdown you know the defense started you know We need to do our part. We need to get the ball back to Rosen and company. So I think it was just them stepping up in the moment. It was more what it was about. Let's play a psychology word association game. Oh, I love these. I'm going to throw something at you. First thing that comes to your mind. I'm ready. Sean McGrew. Bottled up. Ooh. And I know that it's very rare that you get to bottle up Sean McGrew, but he only had seven yards in the first half. That, I mean, if you had saw that, you would take a double take like Sean McGrew, seven yards first half. That's... That's not right. I mean, he, he did finish with 90 yards. He did have a better second half, but he just had no lanes for the, for the whole first half and then for the beginning parts of the second half. So I'm, I know he's looking to have a big game. He's ready to get that, that poor game out of his system. I know he, he's hoping to, to bounce back against Crenshaw, which we all assume that he will, and, and, and getting his confidence right for that, uh, that big modern day game in, in two weeks. Rankings. <sighs> Rankings. Unimportant. I don't. I don't think this team looks at rankings that off that much, and I know that they know the only thing they have to do is go and make that run for the state title, and everything should fall in place if that happens. If they keep, if they keep winning and they bounce back, and if they so if they run the tables, they'll be just fine. They'll be in that national title conversation. And you think they can leave this behind them and just continue on? Oh, absolutely. Because remember. This is just, it was just a preseason game. It was a huge preseason game, but that's all it was, just boiled down to a preseason game. They wanted to know where they were. They stood before they entered uh, Trinity League play, you know, where they're real. They're going to get all the trophies and stuff. That's where they wanted to see. I think they got a good look of where they where they hope to be and what they need to work on. So rankings don't, are not really important at this point. They just need to go and handle business for this Trinity League schedule. And finally, coaching. Drawing board. Okay. Like they need to go back to it? <laughs> I think 
not necessarily they need to change a lot of things. I know that a lot of the coaches here had a lot of new pieces to work with, and they didn't know exactly what they were getting. They knew they were young. They knew they were inexperienced, so they need to readjust. They need to look on film. They need to coach these guys up. They have the experience of the big games now. These first the ones they've had in the first few weeks. So I think they're going to find out who their players are. Okay, so they've got this week against Crenshaw, and then it's to the Trinity League, though. So And it's the big boy, too, modern day. It's, so they're starting right off the bat with the big game, which uh, you know some people were saying might be even bigger than the Gorman game just because it's uh, Southern, the two best teams in Southern Cal arguably going against each other. And that's at home for Bosco, so I know that that's going to help them. But uh, try getting a ticket to that game. Game of the week, back to back for Chris. He goes from that St. John Bosco Bishop Gorman game to La Mirada Bellflower. And surprisingly, the Buccaneers are the ones coming in as favorites, a 5 0 record. Very surprising with these, these Bellflower Buccaneers. My dark horse, I'm going to keep saying <laughs> that right, until you, it yeah, looks bad. Yeah, you can keep saying that. Explain <laughs> to us what you saw during practice in the preseason that made you pick the Bellflower Buccaneers as your, as your dark horse pick in the Suburban League. It started with that offensive line. They're, they're really big. They had three guys returning, three seniors, and that does a lot for you know a, a team that wants that has a lot of young talent in the backfield and at quarterback and then outside in their wide receivers. So starting with the line, if, they, if you could block for Demetrius Reed, a new quarterback coming in with, with that system, everything should fall in place. You know, they got the league's leading rusher and Marquise Lowe, so it's obviously paying off there. The passing game is starting to come together. They only had one passing touchdown in the first three games. Now they've had five in the last two. So things are gelling now, and it all starts with that line. That kind of sounds like what you said about Norwalk last year. Was Norwalk not the team with the most experience on the offensive line, experience in the right places, and obviously a pretty gosh darn good running back? Absolutely. That They had the, the winning combo right there in that double wing. All those starters on that line had been playing for two years and three years, so that just culminated in a great uh, rushing attack. And then when you got Rashad Penny back there, I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. So Lowe, obviously there at Bellflower, going to have to take on a Matador defense that is going to be very hungry. La Mirada coming off a forgettable 2013 because of injuries and some tough losses. They have got to be chomping at the bit to get right Burbs style because the league is in front of them and it's all that matters to the Matadors right now. We can say that, you know, Norwalk is not the same as last year, obviously. Fair but, enough. And... It's obvious that the top two teams right now are La Mirada and Bellflower. So this is kind without of question. without question, and this is kind of going to determine who's got the inside track for the league title after this game. So it's a very big matchup, really early, and that's what I'm excited about. But La Mirada is going to be a big challenge for the Bellflower. I mean, Mike Machete said this is his most athletic team he's had in a long time at La Mirada, and I've seen them in, when I was at their scrimmage. Um, they're big, JJ, up front on the line defensively. And they've got a lot of good weapons. Uh, Christian Lara is just playing out of his mind. Uh, two weeks ago, he was 17 for 20 with three touchdowns. He was just unbelievable. Uh, Tony Brown has really emerged right now as his go-to wide receiver. Big 6'4", just athletic, just pushes people out of the way. Uh, the running game is coming on. I mean, they don't really have a, a standout guy right now. It's kind of a committee. But you don't really need that when you got, you know, Lara. Right, yeah. <laughs> so... I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to watch these two offenses go and then which d defense is going to be able to, you know, stop the other. Chris, people can obviously follow you on Twitter. You can also follow PT Gazette Sports for all of the live score updates on a football Friday night. That's it. That's all. There ain't no more. Another episode of Long Beach Sports Talk in the books, and hopefully we will never ever have to talk about forfeits again. Don't bet on it. I can I can dream. <laughs> I can dream. We've also got some other videos on the websites that you need to check out right now. A top 10 best football plays we've seen so far. We've also got a breakdown of everything going on at Long Beach State this weekend. Big West schedule getting going in the fall. For Mike, for Tyler, for Chris, for JJ, for everybody else involved in this show and the press telegram and is that sports <laughs> we'll see y'all in the stands the this weekend. Or something. Take care, Long Beach. Check, one, two, one, two, check. Everybody, can you give me something? Check, one, two. Good. Check. Checking also this thing. Okay. I'm gonna need to get closer to That's me. how loud he talks for sure. <laughs>